Hello and welcome to Tam's Sunday Club. My name is Lachlan Gowdy. Welcome to my studio. And I'm going to be reading you an excerpt from the beginning of my new book, The Story of Scottish Art. I hope that you enjoy it. There are few places in Scotland more isolated than the tiny Hebridean island of Oransey. This wild outcrop tethered to its neighbour Collinsey by a slip of shifting mudflats has been taking its chances against the North Atlantic for thousands of years. It's the last place you'd expect to discover a treasury of Scottish art, but there are wonders here and they've been awaiting you for centuries. The name Orancy may be derived from the Old Norse for island of the ebb tide. Only at slack water can you cross from Collinsey. For an hour or two, a path can be discerned in the sand, an ancient track that is marked by a few subtly placed boulders. In some spots, you have to wade through shallow pools of seawater. People have been making this crossing for thousands of years, but on any given day, there are few visitors to the island, and it has more seals than inhabitants. Orensee is not so much a geographical location as an island in time. The walk across may be brief, but with every step you overtake the centuries, traversing a landscape that would have looked no different to the pilgrims, monks and masons who have come this way before you. In their day, the path would have been interrupted by a stone cross, a marker of hope, submerged twice daily beneath the tidal streams. In Hebridean folklore, it's recounted that in the 6th century, the Christian missionary St Columba sailed across from Ireland, accompanied by a follower named Oren. After realising that on a clear day, he could still discern the contours of his Irish homeland, Columba climbed back into his coracle and sailed on towards the island of Iona, hoping that Ireland would disappear below the horizon. Oren stayed and established a monastery, and while the surviving stones proffer no evidence for such an ancient foundation, the remains of a priory dating from the 14th century exist on Orensey to this day. It's a tranquil spot, with a view that embraces the mountains of Jura, the coastline of Isla, and the open Atlantic. Over the years, the buildings of the monastery have settled themselves into the earth, and lichens and mosses have softened the contours of the architecture. From the church door, you can hear waves upon the nearby sands and the call of the curlews. However, it's not the setting that makes this place remarkable. It's the art. Outside the church buildings stand two stone crosses. The larger of the two is 3.7 metres tall, and upon one face, a carved interlaced pattern threads its way towards the top of the column. There, suspended upon a stone disc at the intersection of the cross's arms, hangs the body of Christ, sculpted with great tenderness. He looks wearily towards the west, the waves and the salt-lashed wind. This is a powerful religious icon, but it's also an individual artistic statement. Etched into the stone at the base of the cross is a Latin inscription that identifies its maker. Mel Sechlin O'Quinn, Mason, made this cross. We know little about the nomadic sculptors of Western Scotland in the late 15th century when this was carved, but we do know that Mel Sechlin O'Quinn was Irish, one of a family of craftsmen who originally settled on Iona. For generations, they plied their trade, sculpting effigies and stone crosses. Gallic aristocrats employed them to commemorate their lives, and the reputation of the Aquins spread across the Western Isles. I was born in Scotland, and I've painted since I was four years old. Most of my lessons were learned from my father, a painter before me. If Mail Sethlin was anything like me, he would certainly have watched his dad at work and been delighted by the faces and patterns, beasts and birds that emerged each day from the hewn stone. In a corner of the workshop, out from under his father's feet, 
he probably chiselled his own efforts upon cast-off fragments, badgering him for stubs of charcoal to draw with. It's how I learnt as a boy. Eventually, Mel Sechlin grew up to become a master craftsman, presiding over a workshop on Iona. He used his hands every day, practised his skills, was fulfilled and frustrated by his craft. He was an artist. One of the grave slabs carved by O'Quinn, or possibly an ancestor of the same name, still lies in the grounds of Iona Abbey. It depicts a warrior, portrayed life-size and lying in armour. A loyal hound supports his feet, there are angels upon his shoulders, interlaced patterns and a griffin. The craftsmanship is so fine that you can imagine the pleats of his stone tunic ruffling in a breeze. Once again, chiselled into the stone is an inscription that records the craftsman's identity. Male Sechlin O'Quinn, Mason, fashioned it. But what intrigues me about this monument is the name of the deceased, Lachlan. To read my name carved by O'Quinn's own hand makes me feel a particular kinship with this creative ancestor. Around the year 1500, business began to dry up on Iona, so Mail Sechlin uprooted his workshop and moved. After perhaps convincing a handful of apprentices to accompany him, he retraced Columba's journey and sailed for Orensee. There, he resumed his work, overseeing the restoration of the priory and carving yet more grave slabs. O'Quinn founded a school of monument carving that thrived on the island for 60 years. Students learning from their mentors unlocked images from blocks of stone, ships, plant scrolls, angels and warriors. As they worked, their chinking hammers accompanied the voices of the church choir echoing across the cloisters. By 1500, the art of Scotland had been evolving for centuries. But for every male Sechlin O'Quinn, there were hundreds of other artisans and artists whose works were unsigned, known to us only by the beauty of the objects they crafted. The foundations of an indigenous creative spirit were laid by these anonymous artisans, carved in stone, sculpted from ivory, painted on vellum. The history of Scottish art is their legacy, and I would like to meet them. This book is my pilgrimage, my attempt to trace the elusive sources of Scottish creativity and perhaps to gain a clearer understanding of the forces that have shaped my own identity as a Scottish artist. As a painter, I know that each picture I create has to start with a first mark. It might not look like much, but given time, it'll evolve into the structure of a complex painting. It's the same with art history. And the first tentative marks in the story of Scotland's art weren't made in a studio or a workshop, but in the great outdoors. The first stop on any journey into the story of Scottish art is Kilmartin Glen, situated at the top of the Kintyre Peninsula. At first glance, it's an unremarkable place a fertile valley bordered by low-lying hills. But look closely and you begin to notice that the hillsides and fields are dotted with unusual slabs of rock and collections of curiously placed standing stones. Along its length, this valley is, in fact, brimming with ancient art. It's a 5,000-year-old museum created by the first generations of stone carvers in Scotland's recorded history. The earliest forms of Scottish art seem almost invisible, hardly registering as human interventions. The ancient stone carvings known as cup and ring marks consist of round, shallow scoops measuring a few centimetres across, enclosed within three or four concentric rings. Typically, they form part of a wider grouping resembling the ripples in a pond created by a shower of pebbles. Large clusters of these marks are scattered across the rocks of Kilmartin Glen. 
We don't know exactly when they were made or by whom. But around 5,000 years ago, the settlers in the coastal regions of Scotland began to make their mark. Using stone chisels, they picked out impressions on the most suitable bedrock and boulders. And blowing away the dust, they revealed an imprint that would last millennia. Well, thank you very much for listening. As I say, that was just a short introduction to the earliest part of my exploration of 5,000 years of Scottish art history. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>